emotions aren't uh, a hard thing if you happen to be a guy like this, if you happen to be a Vulcan, um, then they're, they're not hard to get a hold of at all because they don't have any. Um, but for us who do have emotions, who have feelings, they're a hard thing to get a hold of. That's why uh, we started this series last week, Emotions, What Do You Do With Them? Because they're a tough thing to handle for us. Um, last week we... Um, we looked at the whole issue of dealing with, with emotions, the problem of dealing with them. Um, we began this series by, by noting when it, that when it comes to emotions, what we do with them, how we deal with them, is that we have to be able to look and to see that emotions are there to reveal what's true inside of us, or to reveal what we think, not rule how we behave. Because that's exactly what happens to us. We take our emotions, and all of a sudden, they become reality to us. What we feel becomes God to us, and then we just behave based upon how we feel. We said that emotions were important, that feelings were important, because God gave them to us. And God gave them to us because the God who created us is a God of emotion. He is an emotional God. That doesn't mean he's an emotional basket case. We're emotional basket cases. But he isn't. He gave them to us that we might be able to fully relate to him. That we might not only logically understand him and what he has done for us, but that we might emotionally feel it and be transformed by it. God doesn't want us just to know God wants us to experience his love. Experience to, to the point that, that it touches us inside. Every nerve, every fiber of our being, that what we experience from him transforms us because literally we can feel it in every system in our body, in our respiratory system, in our circulatory system, in our nervous system. We feel because God has given us the ability to feel that we might feel and know just how much he loves us, that we might be able to love him in the way that he created us in his image. It's a powerful thing. Why do emotions matter? Because God gave them to us. God gave them to us that we might be able to relate to him and that we might be able to relate to others. The problem is sin comes into the world and it distorts everything. It distorts the way that we feel. It distorts the way that we think. It distorts the desires that we have and the behaviors that we engage in. And that's why we said last week, the first principle that we need to understand when it comes to emotions is that they are there to reveal what we think, not rule how we behave. This week, I want to, as we look at how to relate with our emotions, the best place to begin is to begin with the God who gave them to us. And so this morning, I want to begin by looking at how do we relate to God with our emotions? Um, because most of us don't relate to God with our emotions. When we have deep feelings welling up inside of us, most of us go to friends or we go to family members um, we go to therapist, or we go to the local bar, or we go to the wrong person. 
We go to everybody but God to share our feelings. And the reason we do that is, I think deep down inside, we think that, does God really want to hear what we feel? I mean, does God really want to listen to all of my whining or, or bragging? Does God want to hear about how I'm struggling today because my boss is a jerk? Or um, my wife hasn't been nice to me or my, my husband's hurt my feelings? Does, does God really want to know how upset I am that, that others don't understand me? Or that I think it's not fair that people who aren't as nice as I am seem to have more? Does, does God really want to hear all that junk? When we don't want to hear it. And, and God's got bigger things to do, right? I mean, God's got a universe to run. God's got important things to do. People to bring to salvation. People who are, who are hurting in the world by horrific things. Does God really care about what I feel? I mean, we all know good time management means you don't waste your time uh, listening to whiners who sound like losers and winners who just sound like braggers. God doesn't waste his time with that stuff. I mean, good time management, you try to stay away from people who waste your time, Right? Uh, that's how we see things. And that's how we think God sees things. We think, I, yeah, I can't share this stuff with God. God. God doesn't listen to that stuff. God couldn't do the stuff he's doing if he had to listen to all my feelings. Uh, the problem with that is this. We distort what's going on with God. And really what we do is we forget that God's presence is equal to his power and that his power is equal to his presence. Now just think about it for a minute. If God can't be present with us like the air is present that we breathe, then how powerful can he be? If God can't take care of the problems of the world and yet still listen to my whining or, or to me celebrating, if God can't handle that, then how powerful is he really? His presence has to be equal to his power just as his power has to be equal to his presence. In the same way, because of that, we know that God cares because his character is in his caring. How can God be a God of character, a God of compassion and concern, but not really care about how you feel, no matter how messed up it is? No matter how selfish it is. No matter how sinful it might be. God's character is a character of concern and compassion and caring. And so his presence has to be equal to his power as his power is equal to his presence as his character is equal to his caring. God cares about what you feel. He truly does. This morning, we're going to, um, to look at, a, at a, an example of this. Um, last week, we looked at King Saul. This morning, we're going to look at another king, David, who followed Saul. 
And the difference between the two is remarkable because David, I mean, Saul never really embraced God to share what he felt. But David's different than Saul. David is willing to embrace God and to share all of his feelings. Um, this morning, we're going to look at Psalm 6. Um, and let me say this. This is a psalm that David's struggling. And so let, let me make it clear. God doesn't only care when you struggle. In fact, all of David's psalms are not about struggling. Uh, this is a song of, of, uh, of petition, but David and the other psalmists would write and express their feelings about celebration, about the royalty and the majesty that they experienced in God. They would share their struggles and their relationships. But what we see in this psalm and the principles that we're going to learn from this psalm is the same for all of them. And so as we look at them, I want you to remember that. It isn't that God just cares about the bad news. God cares about the good news. He cares about whatever it is that you care about. Um, so let me kind of just give you a little background information. We don't really <coughs> know when David wrote this psalm. Uh, it could have been when he had sinned with Bathsheba and God had punished him um, as he committed adultery and as uh, he even led to the murder of her husband. It could have been during Absalom's rebellion when he was older and was feeling helpless and was sick and wasn't able to really deal with what was going on. It could have just been David wrote this psalm as he was getting older in life, as he was experiencing the same stuff that we experience as we get older. Uh, the feelings of being overwhelmed, the inability to be able to do what we used to do in our youth, to be able to control things better. We don't know exactly what was going on or when David wrote this psalm. We're pretty sure he wrote it more towards the end of his life. And so as we look at this, I want you to follow along. And I'm just going to kind of give you a brief little outline of it. And then there's a principle I want to share with you. So uh, let's begin. Uh, first three verses. Listen to what David says. Lord, do not rebuke me in your anger or discipline me in your wrath. Have mercy on me. Lord, for I am faint. Heal me. Lord, for my bones are in agony. My soul is in deep anguish. Turn, Lord, and deliver me. Save me because of your unfailing love. First thing that, that, that David does is he comes before God and he, he shares his problems, what's going on with him. Back it up to the beginning. He shares with God his spiritual problems. He understands that spiritually he's a mess. That he has sinned against God and there is no reason for God not to be angry with him. This is about the smartest place to go. The smartest thing to do is to take inventory of what's going on with you spiritually. Because here's the thing about emotions. If you don't take them to God, if you don't share with God what's going on inside of you, how you're feeling, if you don't look at your sin and bring it to him, your emotions will become more and more distorted because you'll take them somewhere else. You'll engage in behaviors that will just bring you down a rat hole. And so David's willing to go before God and to plead with him. And to begin his pleading by saying, look God, I know that I am a mess and I don't like it. And I, I deserve your ass, but I ask for your mercy. He 
shares with him what's going on emotionally. He shares with God what's going on morally. He recognizes that, that he, he has to fall before God for his mercy because what he does to others, he does to God. He cries out to him physically. Listen to what he says. I mean, how many have been here? For I am faint, heal me. For my bones are in agony. Remember what I said about the emotions that God gave us? That they're so powerful that when we become emotional, whether it's joy or whether it's heartache, God has made it that we don't just have a logical understanding. I mean, it affects us. It affects us neurologically. It affects our circulatory system, our cardiac. I mean, our heart races, whether we're joyful or whether we are in a place where we are fearful because of our sin. It affects the way that we breathe. I mean, to, the, to our very bones. We experience what we feel. Um, I just lost her name. The gal in Star Wars who just died. Thank you, Carrie Fisher. She dies one day and her mother dies the next. Don't believe you can die of a broken heart? Better think twice. Her grief became so overwhelming that she felt it physically to the point of even death. That's how powerful our emotions are. That's why we turn to God with them. That's why we go to God and we know we take them and they become part of our plea. We put it on the table before him. We lay, lay before him all of our problems. Listen to the plea he makes. Uh, verse f- four. Uh, excuse me, five, four, yeah. Turn, Lord, and deliver me. Save me because of your unfailing love. Among the dead, no one proclaims your name. Who praises you from the grave? I am worn out from my groaning. All night long, I flood my bed with weeping in drench my couch with tears. My eyes grow weak with sorrow. They fail because of all my foes. <laughs> what is he saying in his pain? He comes before God and he makes a plea and his plea is for relief. God, take away my failures that haunt me. Take away my my fears that scare me. Have you ever done that? Have you ever just cried out to God because you look and you say, God, I'm surrounded by my own mess, my own junk. I'm surrounded by all my failures behind me. I'm surrounded by my, my, my frustration around me today that I can't do anything. I don't have a move to make. And when I look before me, all I see is doom and disaster. And all I can do is awfulize everything that might happen. And I become filled with such anxiety and terror that I weep to the point that I drench my bed and my couch. And he he cries out to God this plea for relief based upon what? God's love. Because it's God's love. It's the act of his will based upon what is holy and right and what he feels. We have to remember that God isn't Mr. Spock. 
that we don't lay on the ground weeping and in, 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 in an agony expressing all that's going on inside of us to a God who just looks and says, that's not logical. Get up, act like a man, act like a woman. We express our pain before God because we know that he can relate to us because he feels as we feel. Remember Jesus who, who wept over Lazarus? Who looked over Jerusalem and, and, and longed for them? We have a God who feels what we feel. We have a great high priest in heaven, the writer of Hebrews tells us, who understands everything we're going through because he went through it. I want a God who feels what I feel. I want a God that can help me feel what he wants me to feel. He shares his, his problem, his plea, he shares his pain, but look what falls. He shares his peace. Away from me, all of you who do evil. For the Lord, the Lord has heard my weeping. The Lord has heard my cry for mercy. The Lord accepts my prayer. All my enemies will be overwhelmed with shame and anguish. They would be turned back and suddenly put to shame. And, and when you read the Psalms, this is what you get. And one way or the other, whether the writer of the psalm is coming to God because he's upset and even upset and angry with God and it's okay to express that. Or he's confused and he feels abandoned and he expresses it. And do you know what happens in every psalm? By the end of the psalm, as he's pouring out his heart, and he feels God's love and forgiveness and mercy and grace and majesty, things just change. Have you ever done that? You're afraid of something. You, you don't feel like you can, you can move a step forward. You're totally overwhelmed. You've blown it, you've messed it up, or, or others just seem to be like sharks circling you, waiting to just devour you. And you, you fall before God, and you cry to him. And as you call him and cry to him, God brings to remembrance who he is. And all of a sudden, peace comes over you. Because you remember that God is good. I have peace because I have assurance that I know that God is good. He's not going to allow those he loves to just suffer even in their own stupidity when they fall before him. Why? Because his character is built in part on his caring. That's what God wants us to do. To fall before him no matter what's going on, whether we're joyful or sorrowful, and in the midst of it, he gives us peace because God is good. Because God is present. Why do we relate to God emotionally? Because he's there. What good would it be to sit there and weep and wail before God and, and he's gone, took a lunch break, had better things to do, was on the other side of the planet and couldn't make it on this side. We wouldn't be able to express anything because we would be wondering, are, are you here? I mean, is, it, is this Matt? But we don't do, we weep before him, we cry out, we rejoice before him because we know he's here. You've heard me say it, but when I think of the presence of God, man, I nail it in my mind, he is like the air that I breathe. 
I can breathe it here. I can jump on a plane and breathe it in China. I'm assured that when I get off the plane, I never think, will there be air in China? I know there's air in China. I know there's God in China. I don't care where I am. I know that God is good and I know that he's present. He is hearing me and feeling me just like the air coming inside of me and going outside of me. In fact, his presence, when I cry out to him, does that exact same thing. It comes in me and it ministers to me. Because God is good and God is present and God is faithful. The shocks that are surrounding me, he will chase them away. He will deal with them. Why? Because God works all things to the good of those who have been called according to his purposes, who love him. So when I'm crying out and everything seems so desperate, I remember, wait a minute. God is good. God is present. God is faithful. When he says he loves me, he'll never let me go. He'll never let me go. The, the Jesus who says to me, come to me all of you who are weary and heavy laden and I will give you peace. That's exactly what he'll do. I mean, do you find peace in that? That you have a savior who says, come to me all of you who are weary. All of you who are heavy laden, just, just come to me. If you do, I'll bring you peace. I'll feel what you feel. And you'll know it. Here's what I want you to get out of this psalm, out of what we see going on with David. As we begin to get in touch with what do we do with these emotions? Here's a principle that I want you to draw from this. God would have us to learn that our job is to be about making devotion our first emotion. That as we begin to deal with our feelings the first thing that we're going to have to do is understand that there's a priority. And the priority is this, that we engage God by making devotion our first emotion. I don't know if we have that. Do we? No, I've, I've got to put that in there. The key point. But it's the key point. You want to know how to deal with what, what's going on inside of you, all those feelings? You first think devotionally because that's what David did. Whether you're rejoicing over something or you're weeping over something, you make devotion your first emotion. How do you do that? First, you go before God automatically. When you study David's life, for the most part, David always, I mean, all the Psalms he wrote throughout his life when something was going on for him, whether he was rejoicing or whether he was weeping or whether he had been sinning, it became automatic. It became his first reaction to turn to God. In fact, as David got older, it just became more automatic. How do you make... Devotion, your first emotion, you just make it part of what you do. When I feel something, I go to God first. I don't go to my girlfriends or boyfriends. I don't go uh, to just somebody I shouldn't go to. I go to God. Because nine times out of ten, if you go to God first, you won't have to go to anyone secondly. And not that God doesn't give us people to help us and, and iron sharpens iron. But it doesn't sharpen anything until we go to God first. 
And usually when we go to someone else second, it's, it's to bring a multitude of solutions that God has given to us. How do you make devotion your first emotion? You make sure that when you have an emotion, it becomes automatic. I go to God with this stuff. I share with him. If I'm joyful and I'm going to celebrate, I thank God first. Second, we go to him honestly. You want to share your emotions with God in a way in which it becomes devotion, then you do it honestly. That I don't hold back things. I call it for what it is. If I'm struggling with sin, I go to God and I say, God, help me with this. If I'm struggling with alcohol, God, help me with it. If I'm struggling with greed or covetousness or anger, If I'm struggling with pornography, if I'm struggling with just selfishness and the way I treat people, I go to God and I spell it. I'm honest. I don't hold back. Because as you're going to see later, the best way to, to, to relate to people emotionally is to do so honestly. Is to do so with vulnerability. We don't like to be vulnerable. We don't like to be that honest. We don't like to share with people that we're struggling. We don't like to feel those things or think about them and so we bury them thinking that no one will notice. God won't notice. And God looks at us and, and says, what are you doing? Be honest with me, not because I need to know what's going on. I already do. Be honest with me because you need to know what's going on so you can deal with it. How do we make devotion our first emotion? By dealing with God automatically and honestly. Third, expressively. You know, the beautiful thing about when I go to God, and you listen to David, when you read those Psalms, This was a guy who knew how to express himself and he was a man's man. More than that, he was a man of God's own heart. Because you can't really live life if you can't express what you're feeling. You care for someone, express it. I was with some friends of mine recently and guys who I was a police officer with years ago and some I hadn't seen for 15, 16 years. And I I was excited to get together. At the end, I I gave a big hug and I said, I love you, man. And they said, I love you too. Because I don't want to not express those things. I don't want to be that kind of man. I don't want to be that kind of person. I want to express what I'm feeling. And if it's wrong, God will correct it. You want to relate to God in an intimate way, then you have to express, you have to be in prayer. You have to go to him with what you're feeling, what you're thinking. Third, we, we go bef- uh, fourth, we go before God expectantly. Expectant that God will be God to us. That God will enter in to what we're feeling. And, and he will help us to understand it. Because what we feel is a true reflection of what we feel believe I need God to enter into my feelings because what I feel isn't always what's real it isn't always what's accurate but it can be so powerful because it touches right to the marrow of my bones that I can believe it's reality how many people go off and self-medicate 
their anxiety or their depression because they just believe it's reality. Because they feel these feelings. In order to cope with them, they distort their thinking. And it comes out in their desires and behaviors. I go to God expectant that God will help me understand. God will feel what I feel. And God will show me where I'm right and where I'm off. And at the end of the day, I go before God submissively. I go before God knowing that only he can fix my problems. Only he can make my life right. And I have to be right with him. I have to be willing to go forward, being and doing what he would have me be and do. Jonathan Edwards, who was a great evangelist, great preacher, one time went three days without eating or drinking. And all he did in that time was plead with God. And his plea was this, oh God, give me New England. And God did. And he led one of the greatest revivals in our area. Because his heart was with God's heart. His emotions were linked into what he felt God was grieving at that time and that was the sinfulness of this area, of this culture. To the point that he wouldn't even, even eat or drink because he was consumed with this idea that we can't go another day without God. That nothing else matters without him. See, here's the thing, and here's the real deal in this. If we make devotion our first emotion, then our emotions will be free of distortions. Our thoughts will be free of confusion. Our feelings, our desires will be free of corruption. And, and our behaviors will flow right out of our salvation. Do emotions matter? Oh, you better believe they matter. The older I get, the more I deal with people. The emotions are just always there. And it's okay. Because God made you that way. Because what I feel comes from what I believe. Whether it's true or distorted. But when I bring them to God first as an act of devotion, he's going to erase the distortions. He's going to take away the confusion. And, and that's the deal. It matters. It matters to God. And so what we do with our emotions, if we care, if we want to grow to become emotionally mature so that we can become cognitively mature, that we become spiritually and relationally and volitionally mature, we go before God and we express what's on our hearts knowing that he'll set us right He'll give us peace. He'll give us courage and character to move beyond our fears so that we can love other people and know that everything will be okay. That everything will work out because all things are in his hands. And he cares. Let's pray.